Hey, welcome to this week's The Real Estate of Life with Kevin Riles and friends. I have my friend, this guy right here, Eric Tate, uh, MD, MBA. We're going to talk about alternative ways to invest in real estate and alternative ways to fund real estate deals. He's also a new author of this book, The One Thing That Changed Everything. So I, we're going to have a really, really good conversation. I cannot wait for you to listen to all this great information that we always give you on The Real Estate of Life with Kevin Riles. DJ, hit that music, please. Support for this program comes from the Digital Broadcasting Network, presenting podcasts and web series from everyday people who have an extraordinary passion to make the world a better place. Welcome back to The Real Estate Life with Kevin Riles. I'm your host, Kevin Riles. And remember, it's Kevin Riles and friends. And we are ending Investor April uh, this month with... Good friend of mine, let me tell you before, just like I say always on, on my podcast, I get to talk first, so I'm going to tell you how I know this guy. Uh, I've known him uh, since he's uh, come to Houston. Uh, he went to the same college that I went to, Morehouse College. Shout out to Morehouse College, Atlanta, Georgia, 830 uh, Westview Drive, Atlanta, Georgia, 30314. The house. Uh, the house. Uh, and uh, I'm a little, just a little older than he is, maybe a lot, but a little older uh, than he is. Uh, we've become good friends over the years. He is also my physician, so he knows about all my little bad health stuff that I have going on, that I'm working on, that I'm really, really working on. Uh, and so I want to introduce to you guys uh, today, Eric Tate, MD, MBA, PH, no, is it PH? No, 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 PH. no M, just so MD, MBA. Uh, he is a local physician here in Houston, uh, but he's so much more than just a, a physician. And to be honest with you, today we are going to talk about all the other stuff uh, that he is doing. So welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you for having me on, Kevin. Appreciate uh, it, man. I am excited. I've been trying to get him for a couple of weeks, but as you will find out, I'm sure in our conversation, this brother travels, but not just travels for leisure. He travels for uh, money and business. And so um, usually, Eric, what I do... When I start off with uh, investors, I want to talk about your 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 real estate, but uh, I want you to kind of give me a uh, sense of who you are, kind of your background, where you're from. Uh, unfortunately, you're not from Texas. Everybody can't be from Texas like I am. I got here as fast as I could. There you go. There you go. Uh, so give, give them a sense, give the folks a sense of kind of uh, where you're from, where you grew up, and then your matriculation to all the way to Houston. No, no problem. Thank you so much again for having me on. Sure. Um, so originally from Mount Vernon, New York, grew up there. Is that my, m money earning that Mount Vernon? That is money earning Mount Vernon. You got it, baby. You <laughs> for the kin folk out there. For the, for the, yeah. the kin folk out there. Um, right. So, Went to Morehouse College, um, mm. was down in Atlanta for four years, then came to Houston to go to Baylor College of Medicine for medical school and then Rice University for business school. So I did a dual degree MD, MBA program, did them at the same time. Went down to Galveston for a couple of years. I did my internal medicine residency there and then came back to Houston, joined uh, a practice of mentors that I had at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I always like to say that you guys welcomed me with open arms when I came to Houston, the local alumni association. I always say that Houston is a very welcoming city. I mean, literally, true. no one cares about necessarily where you're from. They just care about whether, whether or not you can get the job done. And if you can, they'll, 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 open, they'll open up with open arms. And so, um, you know, I'm married. Uh, two kids, two little girls, mm -hmm. uh, eight and five. And She's eight years old now. Wow. Okay. Eight, eight yeah. years old now. And, right. you know, I'm, I, I try to stay busy by giving back. A lot of, a lot of the things that I do um, are focused on trying to help other people, um, whether it be in the medicine side, whether it be on the investing side. Um, that's kind of where the, thr the thrust and focus of, of where I am is uh, I try to be a connector and, and help people. And I found that that has helped me um, achieve the things that I want to achieve. So, um, you know, I've known Eric for a while. We know each other very well. And uh, I, I want to ask you this. Uh, we have a joke. Now, this is a joke. He's an excellent, awesome physician. Very, will sit down with you in your, uh, uh, in your consultation and actually consult. Not one of those folks that come in, hurry up and get out. My wife loves that uh, about him as well because she's uh, his patient as well. But some of the, our, our male friends that we hang out with, we call you the anti-doctor. Uh, and the reason we call you the anti-doctor is because um, – he, Eric is not your typical, I want to talk about medical and health uh, all the time. He is, has so many varied uh, interests. Uh, and so I, what I want to ask you about is this MD, M, MD, MBA, when did you have an affinity? When did you notice that you had an affinity for business? Because that's what you, you – I, I know you enough to know that you – Medicine is a talent, and you're good at it, but your passion is business. I, when you talk about, to me, uh, your passion is business. So w when did that spark? It's, it's always been there. So if anyone who kn knew me growing up would have known that I was going to be a doctor from when I was six years old. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of there. Mm -hmm. It was always in the back of my mind. was always kind of driving me forward because um, it gets kind of back to the, to the help thing. Mm -hmm. But 
also, if you knew me growing up, you knew I always had a million jobs. You could, you could have easily hmm. called me a Jamaican, right? So yeah. I was, you know, I first started working for money at nine years old, right? I was, you know, a janitor at a at a at um, an art gallery that my mother was on the board of. And so whether it be shoveling snow, whether it be handyman work, whether, I mean, I was a physical labor mm-hmm. or a person, but I always had some type of gig or hustle or something that I was doing. I mean, we had a, we had a store at Morehouse our freshman year. Right. Oh really? In the, yeah. in the dorm? Yeah, because remember we didn't we couldn't Hustle have man. we couldn't have refrigerators. <laughs> That's I mean, right. if you yep. talk going back from my twenty year reunion in a few weeks, mm-hmm. they still know me and my roommate from Mount Vernon as well, Sarkis mm-hmm. Parker, mm-hmm. as <laughs> sandwich men. Because we cut hair <laughs> and we had I never and we knew made this. Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. So for me, if you knew me, you knew I always had something going. Always had something that that, that was working. And some of that was just purely, you know. I don't like to be broke, mm-hmm. number one. Yeah. And so the thing about it was, and not, many people may not realize this, a lot of guys from Morales went to Baylor College of Medicine. Mm-hmm. And so I knew when I was a sophomore, junior, that they were about to set up an MD, MBA program. Mm-hmm. So one of the reasons why I came to Houston was to go to that program because it had just been started. Mm-hmm. And so I knew that I probably wouldn't have to take the GMAT mm-hmm. if I went there. They <laughs> right. would just take the MCAT. So like, all right, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Plus I was getting a scholarship. So I said, all right, I have a scholarship to medical school. I can use that extra money that I would have spent Mm -hmm. on the business school side of things. Mm -hmm. And for me, it really, I went to business school really to learn how to invest my own dollars. Mm -hmm. Um, It wasn't really like, oh, I'm going to go out there and and go find a corporate job. Mm -hmm. That was, I'm not a, as I like to say, I am unemployable. I Mm -hmm. cannot have a boss. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for me, it it was never an either or. That's kind of, it's funny because that's what I titled uh, the chapter in the book that Mm -hmm. that I have. Um, Because for me, it's always been and both. I Mm -hmm. was always going to pursue medicine and business just mm-hmm. because we're whole people mm-hmm. um i think especially in medicine people get in trouble in that we become so single-minded focused that we get burned out very easily mm-hmm. and i'm there are things medicine is my profession it is a calling i think i'm pretty good at it and mm-hmm. i'm glad that you say so since you actually are my patient mm-hmm. um but it is not all of who i am it is not all of my being mm-hmm. and so what i try to do is keep a varied um portfolio of things that i do so that i feel fulfilled in my life through through living it. Mm. So, so I, I want to ask you this, and we're going to get to not only your book, uh, but all the other things that you have going on, specifically your real estate, because you know I want to talk about some of your 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 real estate history or your real, real estate resume. I get this a lot in the office. I get physicians calling me, or I get uh, brokers who uh, have physicians, uh, have brokers who have physicians as clients, and I have noticed that, and, and this is a, I'm making a generalized statement. You're not included that. Physicians sometimes are not the best business people, uh, and I just want your take on on that. If 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 you think that's true, and if you do or don't, why so? What? Because my experience has been most physicians are very trusting. They're high income earners, and so they are preyed upon. Uh, and, and so therefore, if the prey, if I prey upon you, and my intentions are not great, then you know, you, then you're recovering. Uh, if, if I pray on front of you and my intentions are good, then you're going to succeed. But you, they don't have a sense of how to determine those two two people. So, you know, talk on that a little bit as far as physicians and business people. So I don't think the physicians are any worse business people than any other person who's not been trained in business. Okay. The difference is they have disposable income. And like you say, many people prey on them. Mm-hmm. I, I believe Wall Street people prey on them. And even though they don't call it that, they call it the safe things to do. Um, I think they're preyed on all the time. Mm -hmm. And so because we have more disposable income than your average person, and also we end up being accredited investors, which just means that the SEC allows us to be in projects that your average male man or teacher could not have access to, that you hear projects and opportunities go bad with physicians more often Mm -hmm. because they have the ability to get into these projects. Um, And, you know, not everything is going to go right, right? Mm-hmm. Not every project you do no, is going to course, go right. But course. I do think physicians are preyed upon because, one, they are so busy. They don't have the time to really That's delve right. into what is going on. Number two, they many times don't even know what they're looking at. Mm-hmm. And so no one is taking the time to show them, okay, in this particular project, we're doing this because it serves this need in the marketplace. And these are the downsides that we see. And we think we're going to be able to overcome them because of this. And so in many ways, I think that not even – not even just physicians, but people who are who are 
high income earners who, who, who are academically very smart, they don't want to seem dumb mm-hmm. when presented with new information oftentimes. So mm-hmm. they may just kind of say, okay, I understand when they really don't. don't. Right. Um, and so I think that really ends up being more of an issue than anything else. Uh, and then the flip side is when they get burned, mm-hmm. then they're going to be completely not trusting. So right. then they're going to kind of take their ball and go home. And even when not, they get a good opportunity, it's like, uh, they don't no, see it. They, they see can't it. see right. it because they've been burned before. I've, I've experienced that too. Yeah. Or, and, and here's a problem that I hate is, referral past experience mm-hmm. they know someone who's been burned so that mm-hmm. means everything right. in thing is, is a problem, right, right? That that's too. just it just yeah, it just yeah my boy sense. got burned and had to file bankruptcy and so i don't even want to buy this ten thousand dollar house exactly. you know just because yeah, it's, exactly. it's a no-brainer though no I don't, I, don't, I don't trust it exactly so tell me this is the real estate of life so we've talked a little bit about your life let's t- let's start talking about uh your real estate how did you get into real estate what was your first real estate purchase first real estate purchase Live in or investment, first real estate purchase. Uh, it, actually, it was a year after I got to Houston. Uh, the condominium I was on, literally right down this street, Alameda. Mm-hmm. If you go three miles that way, it's <laughs> right. it's there. My mother in law lives in it right now. Right. And so, I purchased a condo my second year of medical school. Um, and because a beautiful place like Houston, a medical student can mm-hmm. afford to do that. Right. Um, maybe not so much anymore in that area, but yeah. still. And so that was it. But I also knew I was probably going to end up renting it. Mm-hmm. And so I made sure that we bought it at a price point that made sense that if we wanted to rent it, we could keep it as our first um, investment. And so because I don't really look at the house you live in as an, as an asset. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a potential asset. And then if you rent it out, it's definitely an asset. So that was the first. It was a two bedroom, one bath condominium. And gotcha. we rented it out when, we, when, when I went to residency down in Galveston, um, came back lived in it for a short time before we um, bought our the house we live in Houston now, and then now my mother-in-law lives in it. Uh, and so you started off that, when, and I, I call people that listen to the podcast, I call that an invest to live. It's, a, it's really an investment property, but you buy, buy it to live in it for a little while for whatever purpose, and then eventually you plan, you know that you probably will lease it out. Uh, so uh, uh, you bought your first invest to live. What, what made you then start to buy property as in as investment was that the initial plan coming out of medical school or did you start reading or did you start looking for mentors what got you into i'm gonna start really investing in real estate so i got really really lucky so my college roommate Mm -hmm. um it was 1998 summer of 1998 i came to houston he called me and said eric you've got to go get this book Mm -hmm. i'm like what are you talking about he's like dude read this book um, because we had thought about buying 10 townhomes that we had lived in our senior year, mm-hmm. but we didn't know how to mechanically do that. Right, but right. we knew it was a hell of an investment right. because literally anytime one of us were moving out, there were another student on our heels. As we were moving out, they were moving their we stuff in, in because they were so sought after um, in terms of a, as a place to live. So we kind of had a thought process around it. But then uh, it just so happened that Robert Kiyosaki started writing Rich Dad Poor Dad in 1997. And so it came out in 97, 98. Mm -hmm. I started reading in 98. And as he was writing each book, I was going through medical school and then business school and in residency. Mm -hmm. And so in business school um, at the time, I was a biology major coming out of college. So my first introduction to any kind of finance was my first accounting class in business school in summer of 2000 here in Houston. And I'm sure those of you who are in Houston can remember kind of who the high-flying company was uh, in this city during that time. And so we did Crooked Letter E, if you remember correctly, but we did we their books. We can say they, they had a business in round. We can yeah, they had a business. <laughs> but so. here's the thing. We did their books in 97, 98, 99 as my first accounting class ever. And what we you realized- did their books. Yeah, we mean, we just, right. you just get, uh, you just case get study. the- Case study. Yeah, it was just case, it was just yeah. case study, right? Oh, yeah. And you can, it, I mean, you can do this for any company. Right. Just case. grab their either quarterly or their, right, the, their uh, annual report yeah, right. and go through it, Right. And what we found was they had not made any money from operations for the previous three years. And I'll never forget the professor. I tell the story all the time. The professor said the IRS could classify them as a hobby. It was at that point, the summer of 2000, I sold every stock, bond, mutual fund, or anything that I had ever had, even though Enron stock continued to climb for the next year, topping out around 90 in the summer of 2001. Mm-hmm. Then it started to fall, dot-com hit, and everything crashed. Right. And so in my mind, if the guys on Wall Street couldn't figure that out and mm-hmm. were still running that stock up, knowing that these guys weren't making any money from their core operations, mm-hmm. why would I put my money there? Right. And so I knew I was not going to put my money there. And so then in business school, I was looking for franchise and all these different kinds of things. But as a physician, I knew that I was too busy, so I needed something that was going to be passive income. And so that's why I settled on real estate. So what was then your first real estate investment outside of a place to live? So I finished residency in 06. I bought a – so the rest of the country was starting to just get a whiff of the foreclosure crisis. crisis right. But here in Houston, there was one that was up off of 1960. Still own it today. Mm-hmm. A little three-bedroom, two-bath house off of 1960. 
um, going for $44,000. Mm-hmm. It was a foreclosure. Mm-hmm. I said, well, we're going to buy that. Mm-hmm. And so literally one year out of residency, we bought our first foreclosure. Gotcha. And you say we because he has a business partner and life partner. Yes, my uh, wife. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to, to the wifey. Yes. Uh, uh, so um, so you, you do that. And so I know, you know, uh, some of your story. That was your sing- first single family, first truly investment. I'm not living in that property. Tell me how you scaled uh, from there. Uh, and, and we're going to get to to where you are now. But well, how did you scale from there? What, or what did you do to scale from there? So for me, I believe in kind of doing a training situation. Mm-hmm. So uh, we bought that single family got it renovated, did everything we need to do with that, um, learned kind of a the, the hard money to permanent financing and all the tools that were out there for the trade. Because I actually do believe in if you're going to be doing investing and you're going to do a new thing, mm-hmm. you need to learn it. You need to do some personal development, spend some money, go get some training on how to do these kinds of things. This brother spends a lot of money going to trainings every year. Every, he's sending me an email, hey man, you need to go to this, you need to go to this. So he's not just saying that. Go. No, I'm not just saying that. Right. I'm, not doing, I'm not sitting where I am now without that kind of personal development type of training. Um, and so learned all of that. And I was like, well, this multifamily thing, what does that look like? And so you were in on that deal. Yeah. So in 2008, first, first we family. bought our first multifamily. Kevin helped, was, was instrumental in helping um, with the financing on that side of things. And so we bought a small, small single family, bought a small multifamily. And from there, it was just a matter of putting teams in place to be able to um, scale up. And, and it's really all about building teams, right? In the end, almost always we are the bottleneck in our own lives we are the we are the the stopping point from whatever blessings we're going to get and so we have to learn to not try to be the smartest person around or in the room and to bring in team members whose expertise it is and whose day job it is is to do the thing you're trying to do in that part of your um in in that part of your investing I, i would argue that as an investor you're the ceo and you're just putting people in place that can help execute the assets that you want to acquire It's not your job to be out there and be an expert in every one of these types of things. And so from a scale standpoint, we then bought a couple dozen single family homes. Mm -hmm. Um, We started investing in hotels. We started investing in, we created debt funds for investors. I mean, there are a few things that I don't know if you're going to go the intermediate steps. But um, from there that we just, once we understood that teams and building teams was most important, Mm -hmm. scaling is not as difficult. So as much as you feel comfortable disclosing, from a, just a personal side, not the, the more creative things that we're about to get to, but from personal side, how far um, has your portfolio grown? What's in your per- personal portfolio, real estate portfolio uh, now? Well, it's interesting because all the things that we do, so we now bring in outside investors to do mm-hmm. things with us, but in the end, our, this is still our investment firm, mm-hmm. and we just kind of let other people join with us. Mm-hmm. So we literally have Hilton Hotels. Mm-hmm. We literally have international farmland, right? Mm-hmm. We have apartment complexes here in the Houston area. We have many, many single family homes. Um, we, we have debt that we, we have funds that we lend out to other investors um, who, are, who are doing different things. And so I don't know if I could count up all the units, but uh, it's a lot. Yeah, it's over, over 100 some odd right. units easily. So, and, for, and to me, it's more well, important than the number of units. It's, it's the breadth of, the, of what right, we own. The diversification of in it. In terms of international diversification, asset class diversification, currency diversification, um, because we're not doing kind of index funds, right? Mm-hmm. We don't, you know, we don't, we don't do that. So we diversify in that kind of way by owning real things. So the reason I wanted to have you on, and it, it just happened to work out that you're the last person, because um, May, the announcement now is, May, May is going to be Money May. Uh, Money May. So we're going to talk about the different ways of fund deals uh, in, in May, uh, all the way from traditional finance, bank financing to hard money, uh, to um, uh, funds and things of that nature. And so I bring that up because what you have done, uh, unlike some investors, we've talked about partnerships on this podcast before. We've talked about different ways to structure deals. Uh, but what you have done is created a fund, uh, and you just alluded to that as well. So this is a good lead into Money May, Investor April. Uh, so let's talk about that. Um, you, uh, I know because uh, I've been around your presentations and things of that nature, uh, go around and raise money or uh, have been raising money now for quite some time to invest in different projects. What made you do that? And then kind of tell us a little bit about the fund. Okay. And so honestly, it was, it was organic, right? Mm-hmm. My wife and I were doing what we were doing and we had some physician colleagues who wanted to 
partner with us. And we said, mm, don't know if that's legal. Let's find out. Now, interestingly <laughs> enough, I'd already gone to business school. Mm-hmm. And I still didn't realize off the top of my head, well, can we do that? Mm-hmm. And so you found a securities attorney, so someone who's, who specializes in those kinds of partnership agreements and putting funds together. And they said, yeah, here's the paperwork. You know, Back in those days, uh, most of the pr- private equity firms were all private partnerships. So it's really just paperwork. Mm-hmm. People don't realize that investing together with, with other people is just about the paperwork you use. It's not that complicated. I'm smiling because how many times have I said – People don't get together, they don't trust each other, but it's all about the paperwork. It's all about what the paperwork says. You can get together with total strangers if your paperwork game is right. Yep. I'm sorry, I digress. You, That's you just, right. I didn't tell him to say that, by the way. No, but, no, it, yeah. it, it is. And yeah. once you once you understand that side of the business and understand that you don't have to be the person who does it, you can get into these projects with people who know what they're doing, your, your world changes. Because now, again, just like I talked about before, it's not about what you know, and it's not just about you. It's about finding the right people that you can then partner with and then go forward with in a, in a much bigger way. And so once we set that up, and so we don't have kind of a master fund, meaning, mm-hmm. oh, you, money just comes in and we go do stuff. Um, the, only, the only place where we do that is on the debt side. And we just say, hey, these are the kind of things we're going to lend against. So any money that you invest is going to go against something like this. I can't tell you it's this house on this corner or that apartment building on that corner or that industrial on there. That's the only kind of pooled, what we call a semi-blind mm-hmm. pool. Other than that, we do individual funds, or you can just call them individual shares in an LLC. Fund is just an easy way to say a term of people grouping themselves together to go buy something in particular. So it's a very discreet kind of thing. Whereas if you think about it from a mutual fund standpoint on the stock side, you're giving that fund manager full discretion to buy whatever they want within kind of large cap space or whatever Mm -hmm. the parameters are. And so for us, our investors get to choose which projects they are in pretty much on the equity side. They'll say, hey, yeah, I want to be in your apartment deal. I don't want to be in the farm deal. Or yes, I want to be in the farm, but not the hotel project. So everyone gets to choose kind of what they are in. And so we raise capital based upon if we find a worthy project that we think has five to 10 to 15 year lifespan, doesn't mean we'll hold it that long, but it needs to be able to weather out at least one or two economic downturns because there's always going to be a downturn at some point in the future. And if you're not planning for that on the front end, then you're probably planning to fail. Um, so we look at it from that standpoint, and then we offer it to those of us who are in our circle or in our network and say, hey, this is what we're looking to do. If there's interest, we'll go and pursue it. If there's not, hey, we'll, we, we may pass or we may just say we'll just do it on our own. So, so take me through a real quick um, a particular fund slash deal that you've done uh, from, from the Ruta to the tutor. So from uh, the beginning of identifying uh, to uh, also – uh, you know, funding the deal uh, and then taking down uh, the project. So I know you have some, a few to choose from, but take a real, uh, real quick synopsis so people out there can understand what, what that means as far as a fund is concerned uh, and, and what you do with it from the time that you are, uh, do you identify the property first and then go get the money or do you set up the fund and say we're looking for something and then go get the project? So I, I think people have questions as it pertains to what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Got it. So a pro- so process question. And mm-hmm. what I'll try to do is identify some, some larger yeah. um, points as well, um, mm-hmm. larger principal points as well uh, in it. So let's talk about the, the apartment complex we have here in Third Ward. Um, so that was a project that no one else saw. That was brought to us as an off-market project mm-hmm. by a wholesaler. And I don't mm-hmm. know if you've gone through wholesaling. We did wholesaling. Okay, perfect. Yep. Mm-hmm. So this is so number one networking and finding people who are in the space who can help you. So that's kind of principle number one. Mm -hmm. That that project got brought to us that no one else really saw. Mm -hmm. And so we had the time to be able to try to to analyze it. Now, I had already been building a list of potential investors who had already come to me and say, hey, the next time you have something, this is what it looks like. So building an investor list, building a list, letting people know what you're attempting to do, letting them see kind of what you've done in the past, having a track record of success that you can point to and say, hey, we, we own this many things here, we've done this, and then our plan is to now do this. Mm-hmm. You're already priming the pump, you're, you're tilling the soil for when you have great seeds coming to you that you're ready to plant. And so I would argue to you that it's very, it's very difficult. Let me not say that. Let me, let me back that up. It's not difficult to raise capital for a good project, but if no one knows that you are even in the game, right. even if you have a great project, no one knows that, you've, that you're even thinking about raising capital, they're going to look at you kind of a little bit of a so scam. You need to start that early and often. You need to start that, that early because right. what you don't want is a ticking time bomb because right now, especially in, in the United States, forget just Houston, in the U.S., 
good projects are going to fly off the shelf. And so you're not going to have a ton of time to sit there and try to then go raise a bunch of go, capital. Let me go figure out who, I, you know, let me call mama and them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. And so literally like right now, there's a, there's a commercial project, segue, there's a commercial project that someone has brought to me. Mm-hmm. I went out to my list and said, hey guys, I gave them the rough parameters. This is, this is the return parameters. This is what it's going to look like. Probably 8% cash, 15% IRR, five to seven year hold, commercial, national tenant. And there's a bulwark against Amazon. Who's interested? What level are you interested in at? We're taking names now. So I've got almost $2 million sitting there waiting right. if this deal Com- makes sense. Uh, uh, commitment promises. Right. Yeah, and, right. and, and half of them are not going to show up, so right. we're going to get half of them. <laughs> right. But still, what you've done is you've, uh, pe- you've allowed people to identify what their appetite is, mm-hmm. so now you can put them on a list to say, hey, these people are interested they in like this. like retail. So the like next, this, right. Exactly. And right. so I would argue you're going to be building your in potential investor list while you're looking for projects. Mm-hmm. doesn't mean if you get a project, you can't go out there and find money, but you... People can, spell, can smell desperation. Mm-hmm. And if it feels like you're, tr- you're pushing, right. then it isn't about you. And well, it ends up being all about you and not about the investor. See, for me, I'm not trying to put investors into projects just because I need their money. Mm-hmm. I'm finding out what people care about and what they want and what they need and bringing that to them. Because mm-hmm. it's not about me. It's going to be always about what the investor wants. Mm-hmm. If it's just about me, then I'm just going to do the project myself. It's really now morphed into, well, I have this group of people who want X. As long as that coincides with what I, what I want in my portfolio, mm-hmm. we're good. So, in the, in, let's let's take the example of the the retail opportunity you just talked about. So, you've got an opportunity brought to you. You you sent out feelers. You, you got some capital commitments if this deal. So, let's say this uh, for for our conversation. This deal goes forward. What happens now? You 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 say, yeah, I want to do this deal. What do you do? Uh, so now the now the due diligence work starts. Okay, and now this is where you have to have some amount of competency in your in your life. So you have to understand what the metrics are of the asset class it is that you're going to put, be putting together with other people. Who the operator is, meaning the person that's going to actually run the property, because I'm not running it. That's not my expertise. So you have to have somebody who's on your team or a partner or a management company that knows how to keep the place full. And I don't care if it's a retail center. I don't care mm-hmm. if it's an apartment complex. Doesn't matter. The thing has to be operated because operations is what makes you money. And real estate doesn't make you money. The operation, the profitable operations of real estate is what makes you money. So now you have to understand, now you have to put together an investment plan or prospectus. Mm -hmm. Now you can hire that out. That's not something that I personally do. Mm -hmm. I do my own prospectuses. I do my own market research. Mm -hmm. I pull the data from the data sources and then build a story around why I think this will be, this will make sense over Mm -hmm. an extended period of time. And then I go in and do the Excel spreadsheet and do the modeling, right? Mm -hmm. Now, luckily this team that, that, we're going to be working with, they have models mm-hmm. on Facebook, right. but I have to double check them and mm-hmm. I have to check their assumptions and I have to look, right. I just have to do a double you're, check you're on it. you're essentially acting as a fiduciary for your, for your folks. Oh, right? absolutely. Yeah. Fiduci- and for my own money, right? Right. So, right. but, but in the end, I will gamble my money before I will gamble other people's money. Right. I understand. And so I have to go through it myself and then I set up my own securities attorney and we create our own PPM. Do you want to go into yeah. PPMs? Yeah, just real quick. A PPM, private placement memorandum, it, it is basically, um, uh, a dolled up uh, version of his prospectus uh, that is official legal document. Um, uh, and I'm just being brief here, uh, but essentially tells what you're investing in, what are the rules, how do you get in, how do you get out, what happens. Uh, and uh, once you determine uh, um, that, or once you receive that private placement memorandums, then we can go in. I probably need to have a separate podcast on private placement memorandums and accredited and non accredited. But let's, let's just say that it is the investment document uh, that tells you what the rules are. So. Correct. And that investment document should really scare you as an mm-hmm. investor because mm-hmm. it's where we're going to tell you how we're going to lose all your money. But if it goes right, we won't, right? I mean, it, it, it is a legal document. It's going to tell you all the things that go wrong. And so if you find a PPM that does not tell you the things that are going to go wrong, mm-hmm. run away. Mm-hmm. Because either they mm-hmm. are hiding them from you or they haven't thought them through. Mm-hmm. And I would argue any investment you're looking at, the first question you ask is, well, how do we lose our money in this project? And it doesn't mean that it won't happen, but you want the person who's, who's presenting it to at least have thought about what that looks like and what that downside risk looks like and how you're going to be able to hold on and what's the potential liability if you're not able to hold on. So we like the investment. We got the um, PPM uh, and um, uh, you got the property under control. I know we're skipping uh, some steps here, but we're giving a broad overview. Uh, it's time to put the money up. Mm-hmm. You, you send that email back out. You get your you get your capital commitments. Now I need your check. 
uh, that check goes into uh, a, an account for this particular project. fund project. Absolutely. So, and that project is the one that executes the contract, executes the lending if there is going to be lending, and you ultimately own the property. So I'm taking. I just took y'all. It doesn't happen that quick, by the way, folks. But uh, it, it can, it, it it can, can well, though. It, it can, can absolutely it can. can. And, yeah. and great deals. Sometimes it has to happen that quickly. <laughs> uh, so now you're getting residuals from that, and um, real quick. And then I want to get to uh, your book and, and some of the other things that you're, you're working on. I think this is helpful because people think in real estate investment is kind of like the first three episodes of this month where you, you, you have to do this by yourself or you want to do it by yourself. And what Eric is really showing you is that there are multiple ways to invest in, in real estate. And for some folks that want to invest, but don't have the time finding a uh, vehicle, which is what these private placement memorandums are and these private deals are to invest and diversify the risk and diversify the ownership shares so that if it does go bad, you're not losing everything uh, and you're a part of a team uh, is important. So I got this property. It is kicking butt and taking names, kicking off cash. How do you treat your investors? What's, what's happening to those investors when you're getting that cash back? So well, they just you you tell us where you, where you want it wired, and and the money gets wired to wherever you want it. So, Based on the private placement memorandum and how they were going to get paid back. And absolutely. I just want to talk about uh, that for a quick second. That based on how that based on the number of shares and your equity in that particular deal. So when he says equity, that's when his your ownership uh, in that particular deal, and what has been promised in the private placement memorandum is the how money gets back. And most of them say that the investors get paid back before the the partners, and, and well, it depends on how. It's so it depends on how it's structured. Yeah, and yeah. so let me give you a couple of things that people who are new to PPMs and private placements don't often understand. And so one thing is that there's usually a split, meaning there's usually an equity split. And so if you put, let's just say you put $100,000 into a project, if the, if the split is going to be 80-20, let's just say cash flow and equity, well, the owners who are putting that project together, they're the ones who are risking a lot of their capital. They're the ones who are signing up for the, on the loans. They're the ones who put the hard money up. They're the ones who take and put all of the securities work together. And so at the end of the day, when the profits are, let's just say the thing gets sold, mm -hmm. the profits are once you've gotten all of your initial money back and whatever was promised to you, meaning if they did what's called a preferred return. So let's just say they said an 8% preferred return, meaning that the investors get 8% of their money, whether it's paid out quarterly, mm -hmm. yearly, or at the end when everything gets sold, once you get your original investment capital back, the 100000 and if you were in for a year, then 8000 on top of that, everything above that is now profit, and then that gets split 80 or 20. So the people who put the project together gets, get what is called an override, and that can be anywhere from 5% to 50% or more, mm -hmm. depending on the project. And so what I tell people is don't count other people's money. If what you're being promised works for you, mm -hmm then go for that project. Mm -hmm. But don't look at it and say, well, the, the guys who are putting it together are getting 50% of the deal, but, but they're giving you 12 or 15%. And you where, can't get it anywhere else. Yeah, where else are you going to get 12, 15 percent? <laughs> right, don't, don't be, count count, other don't people's be counting money. the blessings. Yeah, don't, don't count be, other people's money. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? If you're getting what it says that you were going to get, then you'd be happy with what it is you're going to get. Now, if you can do better on your own, go ahead and do better on your own. Right. It's absolutely real. But the thing about it is when you do things by yourself, you are limited to your knowledge and to your resources. When you do things in a team... You are you are now you now have X amount of brains mm -hmm. that are working on things and can bring things to the table. And so, what's the proverb that if you, you want to go fast, um, go alone? But if you want to go far, go in a group. See, I'm a licensed minister. And I don't remember that one, but that's yeah, that's what he proverb. said. It's an African proverb. <laughs> oh, I was, so, saying, I was like, was there? <laughs> yeah, it's an African proverb. Yeah. Back back so, to the motherland. So. <laughs> I, I do everything in groups now. There's right. very little that I'm ever going to do by myself so, at this point right. because you just you just naturally evolve in your, not just even just investing, right? It's it's in your life right. as you mature. No, it's, it's better in groups. So tell the audience what you've invested in. I know what you've invested in. One project you've worked on forever and, and now it's starting to come for, to fruition. I can remember when you first started talking about it uh, that's not in the country and then uh, the farm. Tell them quickly about those two. So we have the so the, Hilt, the Hilton in Belize. Uh, we've been working on that project for about four years now and that just opened in December so we're happy the first quarter is open. Um, that's a major project. getting a ton of um, international publicity. It's in been in Sports Illustrated, Architectural Digest. Uh, it, it also we've also now partnered with Coastal Living Magazine, so it's in the Coastal Living magazines as well. So that's been a great project. Um, cash flow we expect to start in the next couple of months, so that's great, and we've ha we've gotten great capital gains on that. Mm -hmm. And then on the farm side of things, we own specialty coffee uh, farms in Panama, mm -hmm. and that's great because it's a low 
entry point, like 20 grand for somebody to get in. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a solicitation, so yeah. as you see, pay attention, <laughs> that is, this is not a solicitation. Right. Um, and, and it just gives a, cre a great diversification play uh, for investors from that standpoint um, and gets allows them to say that they are now an international agricultural investor. Right. So you have um, Belize. Uh, uh, you have the um, uh, where's the uh, the farm in Panama in Panama. Uh, so um, people alternative real estate investments. That's kind of you know our theme throughout this and alternative ways to invest in uh, uh, in real estate. You can see that Eric is not only diversified here has the traditional single families and multifamilies, but also has um, uh, projects outside of the states, which he did a whole lot of due diligence on and spent a whole lot of his own money before he even brought that to the table to make sure uh, he wasn't invested in widgets uh, in a different country country. And it was real. Uh, and I can just remember uh, uh, the pro uh, process. So what do you have now? What are you doing now? You have quite a few things going on. So I want to give you an opportunity to kind of uh, you have the book. So Show the people to the book. For those of you that are watching the video, you can't see this in the car. But for those of you, uh, tell them about the book. What's the name of the book? And what's so your, the name uh, of the book is The One Thing That Changed Everything. It is um, Kyle Wilson, who was the founder of Jim Rohn International. Mm -hmm. So if you know personal development, Jim Rohn, the guy who has made it so that you can actually listen to Jim Rohn tapes and books and CDs. Mm -hmm. This is the man who, who, who created that. Uh, he actually owned the company, not Jim. Jim mm -hmm. was a contractor, quietly. Mm -hmm. um, Kyle mm -hmm. put together a he, – he has a – he's – got what's called a lessons from series and what he does is he creates um, these compilation books where people can tell their story and so in this I tell my story uh, about my uncle who was a surgeon oral surgeon as well and kind of his life and juxtapose it with my life in terms of me being the anti-doctor mm -hmm. he could have been that mm -hmm. and was not and how that may have affected him in his life hmm. okay that's good that's good and, and I, he announced it on his social media platform and i haven't had a chance to read it so i'm gonna cop it uh and uh, and, and read his story oh no uh, you're gonna get it right now because i'm just gonna sign this and give this one to you right here well ain't that a blessing the real estate of life of kevin riles you get blessed on, on the air i appreciate it and I, I definitely will uh read it so you got the book going what else do you have going on so we just launched um, a new physician services platform. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's called The Physician's Road, and you, you can find it at thephysiciansroad.com. Um, we tend to focus on physicians, but in the end, we, it, it can help anybody who's a busy professional. Mm -hmm. And what, what I found was I have a lot of physicians who invest with us, and they would come back to me for other things that mm -hmm. weren't necessarily investment related. Mm -hmm. And so what we created was, and, and you may or may, or may or may not have heard of it, but a lot of physicians are what are called quote-unquote burnout. I don't like the term, but it's being used. So more than half of doctors who are working now would leave the profession if they could. Um, and many wow. people don't know that. And so there's a lot of, a lot of changes happening in healthcare and in the medical field, and physicians are, are feeling the brunt of that. And so what, what I've created is a platform that, to try to help them create as fulfilling a life as possible. So it's, it's called The Physician's Road, Create Your Life in Medicine on Your Own Terms. And we call it The Five Paths to Happiness and Personal Fulfillment. So the path to wealth is what we're talking about here with the investing, mm -hmm. which is where it started, because I was able to become financially independent using real estate and investing in other types of businesses. And so some physicians want to do that. But just like me, I still practice. Mm -hmm. I could absolutely not practice if I didn't want to. Mm -hmm. But I still want to kind of service you and right. your family and all but those you do kinds it on your of people. Own terms. But I do it on my own terms. Because he only has, well, he does it on own terms. I do it on my own terms. <laughs> but, but, but I'm around. I'm, right. I'm available and around. Right. Right? Right. And then there's the path to um, practice. So helping physicians create the most efficient practice that they can that they can have or even help them leave clinical practice if they want. Uh, the path to health, and that's mind, body, and spirit. So we really focus on those areas. Uh, the path of relationships. So it doesn't make any sense if you're doing it all by yourself and everybody hates you, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you interact with other people <laughs> right. in the world in as efficient and as caring a manner as possible? And then lastly, the path of personal development. And that's all about your relationship with yourself mm -hmm. and going inside yourself to really figure out what you really want in life and stripping away all that nonsense that other people have told you you should be and what you should or should not be doing. Um, and so that's really where my, my passion is laying now is really helping physicians kind of build that mm -hmm. kind of life that, that really nourishes them and helps them because I feel that that will then transmit to the rest of the population. Because I hate, I mean, what does it really say about a society when it's healers hate be, being the healer? Yeah, no, you're right. That's, that's, uh, uh, we have to have another one to have you back on on just that uh, alone, those especially those five, because we have we do a, a podcast on it's the real estate of life. So we talk about real estate and then the, the life part as well. So as we come to a close, as the Baptist preacher will say in the Black Church, uh, I want people to be able to find you. So how do they how do they find you? So for me, I'm I'm decently easy to find. Mm -hmm. You can you can email me at Eric E R I C at Vernonville V E R N O N V I L L E 
vernonville.com. Again, Eric at vernonville, V-E-R-N-O-N-V-I-L-L-E.com. Or Eric at thephysiciansroad.com. That's fairly easy. Either one of those websites, there's ways to, to just put in your information and, and it will get to me. Um, and then the number to the, to the office is one 877 668 3311. Again, 1 877 668 3311. You know you're international when you have a 1 800 number as your office number. That's 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 just ball. I just want to throw that out there. He, he didn't give you a, a area code, he gave you a 1 877. So you can call him from Belize all the way uh, to Africa to here in, in Houston. So, uh, man, I want to appreciate, I uh, want to thank you, I should say. I appreciate you. Uh, coming on. Uh, I will definitely have you back on so we can talk about the life stuff. So we talk about some of the stuff we talked about in my in our conversations uh, outside of uh, uh, this podcast. I appreciate it. I thank you. I thank you for helping me end April, uh, invest in April. Uh, I wish we had uh, more time, but we try to keep it to 30 or 40 minutes. But again, I'll have you on. So I appreciate it. No, much. absolutely, man. I, anytime, man. I'm, I'm always here to try to sp- spread And you have a message. podcast as well. Real quick podcast. Uh, the Physician's Road. The Physician's Road. Just go on iTunes or gotcha. you go on the website and you, the episode page right there. Gotcha, gotcha. Hey, I want to thank all of you for listening. Uh, thank you out there. If you're listening, working out, I'm getting good feedback. Uh, y'all are enjoying the interviews. You're enjoying Investor April. I've had people email me asking how to get in touch with, with folks. So that just that feedback uh, does a body and a spirit well. I know that I'm doing God's work uh, when I'm educating folks, which is one of my uh, passions. So we will see you next month for Money May. Thank you again for listening to The Real Estate of Life. Hey, thanks for listening as always. Do you have questions about any of the topics I'm talking about? If you have questions, let me know. Email me at kevin at kevinriles.com. Again, that's kevin at kevinriles.com. I'm going to do a podcast just on the questions uh, that you guys are sending to me. So feel free to send them to me. Again, that's kevin at kevinriles.com.